Uh, last week we started theology, the argument from theology, and uh, the, the basic of, basics of the argument is that Joseph Smith uh, purported to have revelations that include many ideas about the fundamental nature of reality, or what we call metaphysics, and, and then lots of other things, specifically um, kind of branches of metaphysics, metaphysics, so the nature of being or becoming of God, man, and the universe, so what we call ontology, epistemology, all these things that, um, that have been debated and, um, and lots of problems within theology that have been debated for thousands of years in some cases. Um, the basic argument is that in many cases Joseph Smith's revelations uh, solve problems that have uh, persisted for, for centuries that are sometimes philosophical, so broadly uh, it, uh, that lots of non-theists have dealt with. Sometimes he solves just Christian specific problems, um, and in many cases they are consistent with the earliest forms of Christianity. So when he claimed to restore things, we're going to talk today about uh, the idea of divine embodiment, that God has a body, and we're going to talk about how um, there was a restoration now that we, can, we modern scholarship can show that, um, that in fact that's what was believed in earliest, uh, early Christianity. Um, and that happens a number of times in, in different uh, topics of, of his theology. Um, finally, and perhaps most importantly, it provides guidance on um, some of the, the biggest questions and problems that we face in our lives. And, um, and so the, the arguments is kind of, are kind of threefold. Sometimes you solve things, sometimes we find things that are very consistent with ancient forms of Christianity. Um, sometimes um, he provides answers to people that um, modern theologians and, and classical, the, classical theologians have not been able to. So the argument is that um, for him to be able to do this uh, required some supernatural help, um, both the restoration aspect, the, the idea that he was the one person to challenge classical theism, um, really effectively, uh, pretty much the only person prior to the late 1800s and then into the 20th century, where nowadays it is being challenged by uh, people of, of, different, um, of different backgrounds, but on his day nobody was doing that much less um, a, a person of his uh, tr training and education and everything else that he was doing. So we started by, to understand all of this, we started by introducing um, the classical conception of God, right? So we talked about how they um, started from uh, post-biblical times and started from Greek metaphysics, right? And then we, we looked at some of the attributes, eternal, this eternal idea of eternal, um, eternalness, so he's outside of time. Simplicity, immutability, um, impassibility, all these attributes that derive from um, a Greek metaphysics. Uh, we then started to look at Joseph's um, idea of God and how he started from a very different place, how he started with um, what is necessary for a religious faith rather than some um, pre-existing philosophical principle like, um, like classical theism. So we talked about that, how that was a starting place how he agreed with the, uh, the, the classical theist that God was self-existing, so necessity was one point of agreement between him and, and classical theists. Um, but he quickly breaks with them with, of course, the idea of an embodied God, which would break from this idea of simplicity. Really, really, remember, monism, this idea that the, the first move mover has to be a single substance or thing. It can't have parts, and that's where this idea of no parts comes in with, with God. Um, of course, he... Um, he has this idea of imminence, but it's very different than a classical conception of being nowhere and everywhere, because if you're, if you're immaterial, you're both nowhere and everywhere, right, and outside of time. His, his the idea of imminence is something that extends from God's physical body. So we talked about, um, about that concept. We talked about his, his challenging of impassibility, the idea that God doesn't have emotions, right, very... Um, very, very important uh, thought for Joseph um, with Enoch's vision in the book of Enoch and, and God weeping, um, as, as well as passages in the Book of Mormon about uh, the post-resurrected Christ that's, that's feeling emotions. Again, very different from a classical conception. Eternal versus timeless, what we talked about, and then the, the fact that at some point at least God could progress, that he was... Um, not an unchangeable being from all eternity to all eternity in a metaphysical sense, but he is in terms of being a God of miracles, being a God of, um, uh, of love, uh, 
but at some point he he progressed. And that was uh, obviously very very big break from classical theism. So what did he say about uh, things other than God? Um, Joseph clearly taught that um, there were other eternally existing persons in the universe. Right? Classical theism starts with the first moved mover, first unmoved mover, God. Everything else is contingent. God creates, instantiates humans and everything in the world by divine fiat. Right? Out of nothing. Was where Joseph says, Joseph says, all the fools and learned and wise men from the beginning of creation who say that the spirit of man had a beginning, right? That's classical theism. Spirit of man had a beginning. Prove that it must have an end. And if that doctrine is true, then the doctrine of annihilation would be true, right? That you could be annihilated. You could be gone, nothingness. But if I am right, I might with boldness proclaim from the housetops that God never had the power to create the spirit of man at all. God himself could not create himself. So Joseph puts forward the idea that man is self-existent just like God is on the same, the same principle. Intelligence is eternal. That's what he, used, what he would call spirit or intelligence. He called them the same thing. So prim, primordial man. Intelligence is eternal and exists upon a self-existent principle. There is no creation about it. Right? So classical theism is God alone. Joseph adds eternally existing persons to the mix. Again, the spirit of man is not a created being. It existed from eternity and will exist to eternity. Anything created cannot be eternal. And earth, water, etc., all these had their existence in an elementary state from eternity. We'll get to uh, the elements as well. This is, we'll get to this quote again. But focusing here, the spirit of man is not created being. Sterling McBuren said, In traditional Christian doctrine, man's reality is rooted in the created act of, creative act of God. Where God is infinite, man therefore is finite. Where God is eternal, man is temporal. Where God is secure, man is ontologically insecure. Remember, ontologically the being, your, your entire being is insecure. Where God is identical with the very fact of reality, the existence of man is inevitably in doubt and precarious. He goes on, more than anything else, it is this belief that man, though finite, nevertheless has necessary being, so self-existence, that constitutes the philosophical justification of much of the substance of Mormon theology, which stands in opposition to the classical Christian orthodoxy. Now, this cannot be understated, the importance of this belief, that man, though finite, nevertheless has necessary being. We exist from all eternity, we cannot be destroyed. We're going to get a little bit into some of the ideas about humans now. We, if we understand that we're self, Joseph taught that we're self-existent, cannot be destroyed. He also taught that their all intelligence is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself. So, one of the characteristics of a, a primordial human is is free will, right? What we would call libertarian freedom. Since an intelligence is essentially and eternally a self-determining personal agency, God can take away free agency only by causing the intelligence to cease to exist. Because intelligence exists of ontological necessity, it is metaphysically impossible for God to coerce an intelligence. Right? This is a, this is a huge, huge difference. Joseph would argue, Joseph's theology is that it is metaphysically impossible for God to coerce an intelligence. Because to do so, right, he would have to make it cease to exist, and he cannot do so. We exist on a self-existent principle like him. So our agency is inherent. Five characteristics of human spirits that can be gleaned from Joseph's teachings. First, we talked about necessity. Man is a self, as a self, is eternally self-existing, cannot be created or destroyed. He's not a product of nothing. All right, if you're created out of nothing, he's not a product of nothing. Individuality. Man as a self has never been identified wholly with any other being. Autonomy. The self is free. Consciousness. There is no inanimate intelligence or unconscious mind. And finally, five, capacity for development. We, we talked about this quote earlier. All the minds and spirits that God ever sent into the world are susceptible of enlargement. So in Joseph's theology... This is the theology of man. This is the ontology of man that is so different from your instantiated out of nothing. He says every person has these five characteristics 
you exist necessarily, you're an individual necessarily, you've never been identified wholly with another, and you will never be identified wholly with another being. You're autonomous, you have free will from, uh, that is inherent. You're conscious, you're aware of self and others, and you have a capacity for development. This is the idea of man, yes? This just like puts a whole new spin on the council in heaven, or Satan, you know, proposed his plan because it, it like... It was metaphysically impossible yeah. as, as, as Joseph taught, right? The idea that, A, you could, you could take away agency. Um, it was metaphysically, impo it was an impossibility. God cannot force, coerce free, free agents. He can, you know, limit freedom, right? And by circumstance or other things, mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. but cannot take away the, really the will. Yeah. All right. So we've added this idea of humans. We talked about the five characteristics of, of primordial humans. He also taught that the basic constituents of the world are eternal, the elements, right? Element had an existence from the time he had or God had. The pure principles of element are principles that can never be destroyed. They may be organized and reorganized, but not destroyed. This is taken to mean that the basic constituents of which the world is composed are without beginning and without end and are therefore uncreated. They also would have, therefore, some immutable characteristics, just like humans, right? So, for Joseph, God is not the totality of original being. He is not the ultimate source or the creator of all being. He exists along with humans, human minds or spirits, with necessary existence and agency, as we talked about, as well as the basic constituents of the universe, with necessary existence and properties. Right? This is a very different worldview. So what does it mean for creation? Obviously, it means that he's denying creation ex nihilo. God creates out of pre-existing matter. Also, it means there's not a divine order of reality that contrasts essentially with the mundane physical universe of ordinary experience known to us with sensory, sensory data. There is no immaterial substance, and spiritual entities are not less material than physical objects. He is denying, right, this idea of immateriality, this Greek idea that the highest level of reality um, is non-material, is outside of time, this world of ideas. He's denying that. Even spiritual entities are material in some sense. The materialism of Mormonism is not in any way a denial of the reality of spirit or of heavenly beings. Mormonism teaches a strict numerical dualism of the spirit and body. Though they are both material, they are two different entities. But the dualism is in number or degree only and not in the fundamental quality or character of reality, right? For, for the Greeks, it's in the fundamental quality or character of reality. One is a higher order of reality, right? Ideas are higher order. A fact which distinguishes the Mormon position from the typical mind-body dualism that has typified Protestant thought, for instance, since Descartes. The case for materialism is stated explicitly in the Doctrine and Covenants. There is no such thing as immaterial matter. All spirit is matter, but is more fine or pure and can only be discerned by pure eyes. We cannot see it. Right. So creation is not out of nothing, and uh, it, it it has and it's um, and it's works with stuff, with materials um, of two different types, but that are both stuff, spirit and more granular physical matter, um, both of which have, um, have substance to them in, in some sense of the word. So we have this rejection of eternity as timelessness we talked about. We conceive of God as being in both time and space. Of course, this is a radical departure from the position of traditional theism, whether Christian, Jewish, or Islamic. The failure to recognize the far-reaching implications of this idea is a failure to come to grips with the somewhat distinctive quality of Mormon theology. Right? That God exists along with eternally free, self-existent persons and matter is a radical departure, and it is really what makes Mormon theology distinctive, and it will flow through to all other problems and, um, and issues that we come across. For example... What does the word omnipotent mean or all-powerful when God is not the only self-existent being? Right? We talked about the limits that classical theism placed on omnipotence, and they were really principally of two types. Right? First, God can do most things that are logically possible. So most theologians would put a, a limit on God's power based on logical possibility. Right? 
can't make two plus two equals five. We're talking about a few people that go that far, but most classical theists don't. And then the other limit they would put is that he cannot do things that are um, against his basic uh, nature. Can't be evil, can't lie, right? But what is it? Ha what happens when you add in individual autonomous, primor autonomous primordial humans and the basic constituents of the world? It means, right, that all power has to account for these things as well, right? So we'll have a, a redefinition of omnipotence when we have individual autonomous primordial humans and the basic constituents of the world, both of which are eternally self-existent and have properties that you have to deal with. So we get Doctrine and Covenants 121. The powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. No power influence can be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, long-suffering, and we get a bunch of uh, things about being nice. No power influence can be maintained. This is a huge, huge difference from classical theism. Classical theism sees of a god that has coercive power. Coercive power, right? My will, I will put my will on something else and, and make it so, right? We feel like we have coercive power, when we you know, hammer a nail into a board. That feels like coercive power because we're subjecting that nail to our will. Dr. Covenants 121, because of individual and autonomous primordial humans that are self-existing, and even the basic constituents of the world with their, which are self-existing, teaches that the only power that you can have is by persuasion. There is no such thing as coercive power for Joseph Smith. The statement of persuasive power being the only real power is a repudiation of coercive power and again a radical departure from classical theism. So, let's uh, do some comparisons here to, to try and sum up classical theism versus Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith claimed to reveal the original Christian understanding of God. His theology differs drastically from classical theism, CT, in at least the following. Necessity. Only God is necessary in classical theism versus God, primordial humans, and basic constituents of, of which the world is composed is ne ne has necessity in Joseph Smith's theology. Timelessness. God is outside of time and space in, cl in classical theism versus God having a past, present, and future in Joseph Smith's theology. Immuted, immutability and passability. God cannot be affected by anything. He lacks passion, passions in classical uh, theism. Versus Joseph Smith's weeping God that feels. Simplicity. God has no parts in classical theism versus an embodied God for Joseph Smith. Omnipotence. God can do all things consistent with logic and his attributes for classical theism. Versus a God that can do all things consistent with logic, eternally self-existent and free persons, and eternally existent basic constituents of the world for Joseph Smith. Creation. All humans and matter were instantiated out of nothing, ex nihilo, for classical theism, versus a god that worked with pre-existing matter and pre-existing intelligences to create. Relationship to humans. An ontological gulf, right? A difference of being separates God from humans in classical theism. We are fundamentally creatures. He, he, he did not create like to like. He created something different. Versus God and humans are both self-existent and capable of enlargement for Joseph Smith. When David Paulson and I wrote a paper called Joseph Smith Challenges the Theological World, this is what we concluded. The God who revealed himself to Joseph Smith is radically unlike the God of the philosophers. He did not create all things out of nothing. To the contrary, he created the physical universe out of chaotic matter. That God is not all controlling and all determining. To the contrary, we on earth have morally significant freedom. Joseph God is neither timeless, immutable, impassable, nor eternally static. To the contrary, he is, quote, the living God, who is profoundly touched with, the, touched with the feeling of our infirmities and responsive to our needs and petitionary prayers. As Herod Bloom says, the God of Joseph Smith is a daring revival of the God of some of the Kabbalistic and Gnostic, Gnostics, prophetic sages who, like Smith himself, asserted that they had returned to the true religion of Yahweh or Jehovah. The God of normative Judaism and of the mainline churches at this time is rather more remote from the God of the earliest or Yahwist portions of the Bible 
than is the initially surprising God of Joseph Smith. I think transumptively of the prophet Joseph's God when I read the text of the Yahweh Sir J. Ryder, author of the earliest tales of the Pentateuch. The Yahweh who closes Noah's ark with his own hands, descends to make on-the-ground inspections of Babel and Sodom, and who picnics with two angels under Abram's terebinth trees at Mamre, is very close in personality and dynamic passion to the God of Joseph Smith far closer than the Platonic Aristotelian divinity of St. Augustine. So two different conclusions about the differences between uh, Joseph Smith's God and the God of classical theism. Let's now talk about some of the problems uh, that have faced humanity and Christianity in specifics. Um, the problem of human identity it was first proposed, uh, as we can tell by Heraclitus, um, and then later in in more modern times by Hume. Um, it deals with the following problems. Who am I? How unified am I? And do I persist through time? Remember Heraclitus was uh, the philosopher that made the uh, observation that you can never step in the same river twice, right? Mm -hmm. that, that everything is changing. If everything is changing, what does that mean for human identity? Are we persistent? Um, do we persist through time? Again, classical theism. So man is derived from the fiat act of God. What does that mean? God created man totally for his own purpose. God is ultimately responsible for all human action, right? As creator out of nothing, could have created anything he wanted. He's ultimately responsible for everything that you and I do. And man could be annihilated if God so chose. Um, Non-Christians and uh, kind of more in the, in the secular world, what we call either humanism and, or existentialism, um, they've also dealt with this problem. Do you persist as a, as a person? Um, many would argue, so existentialists would argue, that there's no self that persists through time. It's an illusion, right? We talked about Heraclitus, no one steps the same river twice. We change from one moment to the next and are constantly changing. We all undergo persistent qualitative change, right? So David Hume says that we cannot perceive of any permanent self. That's what he means by this, right? Uh, there is no self that, that exists, persists, because we're changing, right? William James, our consciousness is in constant change. Man is a phantom, a useless passion, according to Sartre, right? The darkest threat is the threat of non-being, this is the view identified mainly with existentialism, and it um, tends to promote uh, pessimism in those that adopt it, right? Um, those that, a lot of people get consumed with this idea that they'll be annihilated, the threat of non-being. Um, and if you read existentialist works, um, they talk a lot about this, um, and it, 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 they get very dark, it gets very dark very quickly. Joe Smith's answer. No one or anything can make anyone be or not be. Everyone simply and eternally is, an individual, free, conscious, and enlargeable. The only question, therefore, is to become more or not to become more. He totally gets rid of this idea that is, uh, I don't know if you've dealt with it personally, but has dealt with, been um, debated for, again, thousands of years, this threat of non-being, this threat of non-existence. Some yearn for it. Some Eastern religions... Um, uh, Buddhism in particular, um, the ultimate idea is for the self, right, to be annihilated in some sense, to be, um, you're joining the other, you're joining the universe. Um, so some people welcome it, some people fear it. Uh, Joseph Smith says it's impossible. Joseph Smith's theology dissolves the question of nihilism and the threat of non-being. What about the paradox of, of creation? Uh, I like how Truman Madsen states this, the immaterial trinity elicited or brought from nothing both material and immaterial substance. The unchanging and unchangeable deity yet changed and changes the whole of reality. A non-temporal and non-spatial being, literally nowhere and no when, yet created and infused everywhere and every when. The all-powerful and all-good simultaneously and yet continuously brought into being not only mankind, but the angels, the demons, and Satan. Moreover, like did not create like. Between the divine and all other natures, there was and is and always will be an absolute gulf. This has been dealt with, with by many Christian uh, theologians. And it's a really, it's a paradox, right? 
an immaterial trinity that's nowhere and no when, yet you know instantiates everything that is in time um, and and is material. He's non-changing, yet he changes all of reality. He enters time in this. In, this is the paradox of, of Christ, which we might get to. But he enters time in the person of Christ, right? Only to maybe exit it again. I mean, um, the, the, it's a. It's a huge paradox um, for classical theism. For Joseph, of course, there is no, no paradox. God himself, finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory because he was more intelligent, saw proper to ensue laws, whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like himself. Right. So he's, exist, he's existing um, in time, in space, and he's creating a relationship. A relationship we have with God places us in situation to advance in knowledge. This is good doctrine. It tastes good. I can take the principles of eternal life, and so can you. They are given to me by the revelations of Jesus Christ, and I know that when I tell you these words of eternal life, as they are given to me. Um, for folks that are dealing with the paradox of creation, for perhaps uh, the the threat of non-being, um, these doctrines taste really good. God enters a relationship with other self-existent persons and organized pre-existing matter. There is no paradox of creation. He resolves the paradox of creation created by classical theism. Classical theism creates that by creating a God that's outside of time, static, immutable, and yet is creating uh, time, space, change, good, bad. The mind-body problem. Why is man embodied? Is the body a lasting purpose in the nature or the plan of God? The dogma of immaterialism, right? That's Greek philosophy assumes that there are two utterly different divisions of reality, one immaterial and the other material. Right? The dualisms that result tend to become radical. The soul has none of the qualities of the body and vice versa. Right? If you're an immaterial soul, it tends to, this is where um, theolo uh, theologies have gone, that it bears no resemblance to the body. So again, we have problems that arise when you adopt this point of view. How can two entities that have nothing in common, not even existence in space and time, be conjoined in any sense. How does that even work? How can one influence the other, right, if they have nothing in common? Why would an unembodied God create an embodied man to achieve a disembodied immortality? What's the point of that, hmm. right? These are the questions that come up when you deal with, this is the mind-body problem, when you have the Assumption of immaterialism. It tends to go two ways. One way is physicalism. Physicalism denies that there is evidence for the shadowy entity's mind or soul of traditional definition. Right? So your humanists, your, your non-Christians, would be some of them would be physicalists. They would deny that there's anything apart from the body. Right? Whatever the body is, it is all there is. Man is nothing but acids, cell structures, nerve nets, and then this phenomenon we call mental or mind somehow springs forth from, uh, from the body. So that's physicalism, right? The other way to go um, is extreme immaterialists. So we have people like St. John of the Cross, Gandhi. This is the belief that the body uh, is a product of sin or error, right? They tend to despise body parts and passions because, of course, God lacks them. So they tend not only to disparage the body but to torment and renounce it. So because of this mind-body problem, you tend to go one of two ways. You either deny that anything called mind exists, everything is the body, you exist only by the body, right? Or you tend to um, denigrate the body, right? Because mind is what matters. The immaterial is reality, is, is ultimate reality. An extreme uh, physicalist for e.g. Bertrand Russell since the body, body is all that it is, it is the sole source of happiness, right? We can get into hedonism and all these kind of things, but the, the basic idea, right, is that um, if the body is all that exists, there cannot be joy or anything that is beyond the body, beyond what you're feeling with your body. Joseph's revolution, neither view is correct in his view, right? Mind, spirit, and body are all material in varying degrees of refinement. They have equal status in spatio-temporal existence and are, in their perfected state, of equal worth. 
Right? Spirit and body are dissimilar enough to require each other in full selfhood, but they are similar enough that when our bodies are pure, thus the immaterialist is wrong in what he affirms, namely immaterial entities, right? there's no such thing as immaterial entities, and the physicalist is wrong in what he denies, spirit entities. And thus, a thousand dualistic puzzles and dilemmas collapse, according to Madsen, Truman G. Madsen and um, Eternal Man. Joseph would answer these two questions. Are there satisfactions of the self that are more intensive and inclusive as one approaches the likeness of God? Yes, he would answer. And do they involve withdrawal from the senses? No. Right? So whereas the immaterialist would agree with this, right? He would, yes, there are satisfactions of self that are more intense and inclusive, right? Because there is a spirit. As you approach God, as you become something different, you can have uh, more satisfactions. But they would often sense that they require withdrawal from the senses or denigration of the body, right? On the other hand, a physicalist would say, no, there are not satisfactions of self that are more intense and inclusive as one approaches the likeness of God, okay? Is this a restoration? Is this idea of restoration. Writing about the first century believers, noted church historian Adolf Harnack wrote, he puts this in a footnote, so it's hard to find, but <laughs> God was naturally conceived and represented as corporeal, that means embodied, by uncultured Christians, though not by these alone, as the later controversies prove. In the case of the cultured, the idea of a corporality of God may be traced back to Stoic influences. In the case of the uncultured, popular ideas cooperated with the sayings of the Old Testament literally understood in the impression of the apocalyptic images. In other words, famous noted church historian is telling us that in the first century, Christians believed that God had a body, although in a footnote. He further concedes in the second century, realistic es eschatological ideas no doubt continue to foster in wide circles the popular idea that God had a form and a kind of corporeal existence. First century Judaism also agrees. In all of rabbinic, this is uh, Alan Goshen and Gottstein in The Body as an Image. It's a huge review of, of the literature. Very good uh, if you want to check it out. In all of rabbinic literature covering both the 70 to 200 AD and 220 to 500 day periods, there is not a single statement that categorically denies that God has a body or form. All right? So Christian, Christian, Christianity sprang from Judaism. They shared very, very similar beliefs, of course, uh, at this time. In my understanding, the question of whether the rabbis believed in a God who has form is one that needs little discussion. Instead of asking, does God have a body, we should inquire, what kind of body does God have? Right? He continues, Rabbinic anthropology differs from Hellenistic, right, Greek, and later Christian anthropology, which became Hellenistic anthropology. The distinction between, listen to this, I put this in here because we just read uh, some Dr. Cummins. The distinction between spirit and matter is not known in rabbinic literature. The distinction between spirit and matter. Metaphysically, soul and body form a whole rather than a polarity. Crudely put, the soul is like the battery that operates an electronic gadget. It may be different and originally external to the gadget, but the difference is not one of essence. More significantly, the gadget and its power source ultimately belong together rather than apart. Thus, the soul is a vitalizing agent whose proper place is in the body, not out of it. All right? This is how first century um, Judaism understood it. They did not have this Hellenistic idea, this mind-body uh, immaterialism idea. Immaterialism was introduced into Christian theology at least as early as the mid to late second century. Um, Clement of Alexandria, we talked about Clement, remember his uh, testimony of, uh, of the uh, bringing of, of temple theology down to Alexandria. That's where we first talked about Clement. Um, he was perhaps the first unequivocally referred to God as immaterial. Um, so we see its introduction mid to late second century, but it was not immediately adopted. It was a battle. Origen is a witness. He's a reluctant witness, we call him, because um, he's an immaterialist, but he provides us with evidence that uh, most Christians still believed in an embodied God. He's writing about 8185 to 253. 
He provides substantial evidence that Christians in the 2nd and 3rd centuries generally continued to believe in God's embodiment, despite the efforts of Platonists both, Platonists both within and without the church to persuade them otherwise. Origen's writings support this conclusion at least six ways. Number one, in his most important theological work on first principles, Origen enumerated the doctrines that he claims were delivered to the church by the apostles. Significantly, he did not include the doctrine of a divine incorporality on this list. Right? So he's admitting, even on his most important work, that the idea that God is immaterial, unembodied, was not gotten from the apostles. Number two, he explicitly acknowledged that when he wrote, around the middle of the third century, the issue of divine embodiment had yet to be settled in the church. Quote, how God himself is to be understood, whether as corporeal and formed according to some shape, or of a different nature from bodies, is a point which is not clearly indicated in our teaching. He thus proposed to make the issue a matter of rational and scriptural investigation with a view to formulating a coherent body of doctrine, quote, by means of illustrations and arguments, either those discovered in Holy Scripture or deduced by closely tracing out the consequences and following a correct method. You can guess which way he went, right? Mm -hmm. He deduced by closely tracing out consequences from a Platonist ideal. Three, he discussed 1st and 2nd century word usages dealing with divine corporality, ignorance of which had contributed to misunderstandings of some biblical and early, other early texts. So, for example, he pointed out that nowhere in the Bible is God explicitly described as incorporeal. The Greek term for incorporeal, asomotos, does not appear there. Among the early Christian writers who described God as, as incorporeal, Origen was the first to consistently use the term in its technical Platonic, Platonist sense. Right? So Origen is providing evidence that he is introducing, he is arguing for an immaterial, incorporeal God, um, very, you know, mid-third century. More unexpectedly, Origen informs us that the New Testament passage, God is a spirit, you've heard that before. The proof text, now cited most frequently in support of divine incorporeality, was initially understood as evidence against it. This is really interesting. This is what he says, I know that some will attempt to say, that even according to the declarations of our own scriptures, God is a body. Because they find it said in the gospel according to John that God is a spirit. And they worship him, and who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Spirit, according to them, is to be guarded as nothing else than a body. Mm -hmm. To understand this, um, pneuma, it's translated spirit, literally means air or breath, implying that spirit is composed of material substance. Right? So he doesn't use the term... It doesn't use the term asomotos. God is immaterial, right? God is a spirit, which has materiality to it. So he was actually arguing that the texts that our well-meaning Christian friends might use to say that God is immaterial was actually evidence that he has materiality or corporeality. It's pretty interesting. Number four, Origen engaged in sustained polemics against those who affirm God's human-like embodiment. He argued two parts. First, he tried to show that corporeality is logically incompatible with philosophical, philosophical conceptions of the divine nature. We've seen that. Second, um, he took a lot of time to make allegorical interpretation um, to convince that to understand scriptures differently. Right where where it talks about God having a body, um, he tried to disprove disprove those interpretations, um, and he spends a lot of time trying to do that. Five, Origen specifically included Melitos among the prominent 2nd century Christians who taught that God is embodied. We don't know a lot about his life. Um, we know that he was uh, he was made bishop about 168 or 169 um, in Lydia. Um, this is also confirmed in AD 425 that Melito was responsible for a sect of Christians who followed him in the belief that the body of man is made in the image of God. So we have bishops still, right, in 168, 169, that are explicitly teaching that God has a body, that man's, made, man's bodies are made in the image of God. Finally, it was Origen who preserved the testimony of Celsus, a 2nd century Middle Platonist and non-Christian, who wrote a comprehensive critique of Christianity entitled True Doctrine, which was later suppressed or destroyed. It is known only through quotation in Origen's work, Contra Celsum, composed 70 years later. Celsus attempted to demonstrate the inadequacy of Christian doctrine, especially the doctrine of God, on the basis of assumptions drawn from Platonist philosophical theology. According to Origen, Celsus argued at length against what he understood to be the Christian belief that God is, quote, corporeal by nature and has a body like the human form. 
right? So a second century Middle Platonist, non-Christian, his main argument against Christianity is you guys believe in embodied God. Right? In about 170, 178. Um, he didn't spell out Celsus sustain anti-corporeal arguments, explain that if Celsus invents out of his own head ideas which he heard from nobody, or to grant that he heard them from somebody, notions which he derived from some simple and naive folk who do not know the meaning of the Bible, there's no need for us to concern ourselves with unnecessary argument. All right, so Origen is saying, look, he doesn't, he doesn't get it, but um, quite clearly, that's what his understanding of Christian doctrine was, that God had a body. Tertullian is even later. One or Origen's implication that contemporary Christians who believed in God to be embodied were confined to simple and naive folk is contradicted by one of the most cultured of all his Christian contemporaries, Tertullian, what we, we now call him Tertullian, his real name is Quintus Septimius, I guess, Florens Tertullianus. It's a nice Roman name. <laughs> Tertullian stoutly maintained his belief that God is embodied and passionately resisted attempts by immaterialists to Platonize Christian doctrine. Mm -hmm. So there's a big battle going on. Tertullian not only personally believed in embodied God, he claimed this to be the teaching of the Christian churches of his day, which they in turn derived from the original apostolic churches. Tertullian himself sought to preserve original Christian doctrine as founded on revelation against the encroachments of Platonist immaterialism. His understanding of Christianity included at least six points that support divine embodied. He argued, one, God, like all that is, is embodied. Two, beings of spirit may take on more solid bodily form, right? Both, both being material. Three, Christ in the incarnation specifically took on flesh that was unqual unqualifiedly human. Four, human flesh is a sacred and glorious substance. Five, the same fleshy body that falls in human death rises in the resurrection. And six, Christ's resurrected body is an everlasting and crucial attribute of the Godhead. All right? This is... Um, To support his claim that the creator of the material earth must be a body, Tertullian, Tertullian presented an argument reminiscent of modern versions of the so-called mind-body problem. We've already seen the mind-body problem, so we put this in here. This, he's arguing this again, second century. How could it, third century, how could it be that he himself is nothing without whom nothing was made? How could he who is empty have made things which are solid? And he who is void have made things which are full? And he who is incorporeal have made things which have body? For although a thing may sometimes be made different from him by whom it is made, yet nothing can be made by that which is a void and empty thing. Right? He's giving us here the mind-body problem that then persists after immaterialism takes over. He's giving it to us um, way back when he lost, lost the battle. He um, obviously failed in his attempt, but the triumph of immaterialism came about only gradually. Uh, significant pockets of Christians resisted Hellenistic influences and continued to believe in embodied deity as late as the 4th and 5th centuries. This is clearly shown in the writings of Augustine, uh, right? Now we've moved up 200 years, who ironically was himself an uncompromising advocate of incorporealism. Again, a lot of our evidence comes from these guys that are um, immaterialists, but they show us in their arguments um, uh, what people actually believed back then. So what's fascinating about Augustine is that he would not become a Christian because he thought Christians believed in embodied God. It was only after he met Ambrose, who was a Middle Platonist in Milan, that he learned that God's, quote, spiritual children do not understand the words God made man in his own image to mean that God is limited by the shape of a human body. Right? He was not converted to Christianity. Augustine, the famous writer, was not converted to Christianity until... Right? He was convinced that some Christians believed in an Im unembodied God. Right? He thought that uh, all Christians believed in an embodied God, and that's what it meant to be a Christian. Only when he met Ambrose, who he studied under, um, was he then converted. Furthermore, Augustine provided a catalog of heretical Christian communities or sects. He identified two Christian communities, contemporary with himself, we're talking 4th, 5th century, that explicitly taught that God is embodied in human-like form. Uh, one are called the Adonii, and when are called the Anthropomorphites, that's easy. They were located in Egypt. John Cassian, a Christian monk who spent about 15 years in the Egyptian monastic communities, corroborated Augustine's testimony with respect to Egyptian and anthropomorphism. Although Cassian was an originist and an incorporealist, he nonetheless made it clear that for late 4th century Christian monks in Egypt, 
Anthropomorphism was the long established norm and incorporealism was the innovation. I don't know if I put it in here, but, um, oh, we did. Okay. So Cassian records that Theophilus, Bishop of Alexandria, sent a letter in 399 to the Egyptian churches to set the dates of Lent and Easter. In that later letter, Theophilus included a condemnation of anthropomorphism, which, quote, was received very bitterly by almost every sort of monk throughout all of Egypt. Right? They did not like this part of the letter that mm -hmm. condemned anthropomorphism. Indeed, the majority of the older men among the brethren asserted that, in fact, the bishop was to be condemned as someone corrupted by the most serious heresy, someone opposing the ideas of Holy Scripture, someone who denied that Almighty God was of human shape, and this despite the clear scriptural evidence that Adam was created in his image. Mm -hmm. These monks actually get violent. They go out and start to, um, to riot and... Um, Right? The, 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 this is a, a big deal in the 4th century still. 4th, 5th century. Conclusions. Belief in divine embodiment did in fact exist and persist among the faithful followers of Christ from Christianity's earliest beginnings well into the 5th century AD. Right? It was a hard thing to stamp out. Such a belief was not only not heretical, but apparently was the widely held understanding of God within both formative Judaism and Christianity for the greater part of the first three centuries. This understanding was gradually abandoned as Neoplatonism became the dominant worldview of Christian thinkers. So far from being a departure from the faith once delivered to the saints, Joseph Smith's declaration of divine embodiment is evidence of his claim to restore original Christian doctrine. Second conclusion, Joseph Smith's theology of material spirit and body requiring each other for full selfhood resolves the mind-body problem. There is no dualistic problem. Um, there is no issue of immata immateriality coexisting with, with materiality. Um, let's end there. Any, 